Welcome to Three, a show about Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic and part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm Gil Gross with Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy, both Novak Djokovic and Rafael Nadal. We're in action this week. We just got finished watching the Nadal Barcelona final against Tsitsipas, which lasted three hours and 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Djokovic semifinal against Karatsev in Belgrade, Serbia, both players in their home countries. That lasted, was it 328? Do I have that number right? I think 328 or 318. Well okay. over, feel over three hours. Long. Way. So so we got our uh, our exercise in, I think it's fair to say, right? But uh, let, let's start with the Nadal final. And um, Amy, you were looking at something very specifically in, in this match. Um, so I guess we can we can start there. What were you uh, what were you tracking uh, throughout this Nadal uh, Titi Pass Barcelona final? It was no secret that Nadal was going to go to the backhand. Tsitsipas has a one-handed backhand. That's just what he does, that he never, you know, makes a secret of it. He wrote in his book about playing Federer to the backhand, to the backhand, always to the backhand. Um, But I just wanted to see exactly how much. So, you know, there's a few different ways of measuring this, but basically I divided the court into four, which is what most of the analytics guys do, A, B, C, D. So Tsitsipas's backhand would be zone C and D. Now, if it's hit to zone C, if he can, um, Tsitsipas will run around and actually hit forehand. But Nadal, you know, is, is he's hitting that area of the court, essentially. Um, So in the first set, uh, 67% of the time, Nadal hit to C and D. Second set, 63. Third set, 65. I mean, I just found it. serve count? What about the serve? Yes, serve counts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So I just find it um, interesting, the stability of those numbers. (laughs) Like, um, he doesn't... uh, he, he doesn't change based on the outcome of the set. And um, he does go to the forehand. He, he has two predominant patterns. One is CD, 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 A. Right. And a lot, of times, a lot of times the, the point will be finished off the forehand. Um, if it's not, he just restarts the pattern. And then the other pattern, which is really, I call it the Williams sisters pattern because one of their coaches long time ago told me that when the you know what hits the fan they go to this pattern which is side to side backhand forehand backhand forehand backhand forehand and, and uh, until he's time and until the time comes for him to do something else mm-hmm. well so we those, those are his two primary patterns well look we all know it's a cross-court game i mean the the, the key to success in tennis is hitting cross court a lot until you need to then hit down the line. You see the way Nadal for years has built that pattern. It's fascinating that those numbers pretty held up in those mid sixties. That's pretty interesting. And of course, what he's trying to do is elicit the shot he wants. And I'm sure Nadal's mind, Hey, it's worse against Roger Federer who are used to find Sitsipas. But you see what, what was interesting about Sitsipas. It reminded me of the things Nadal Federer tried to do early in his rivalry with Nadal, which is to be aggressive and offensive with the one hander. And the things he's done more recently, effectively, particularly on other surfaces, clay, a little tougher, more balls. The one-hander won't gain as much traction. The topspin forehand from Nadal is going to jump out of the contact point. I mean, you saw a number of times Sitz Piss wasn't able to do as much with the backhand. I mean, he's hitting, he's hitting a drive, and it's kind of nice, but it's not really accomplishing much for Sitz Piss traction-wise. So Nadal is saying, good. Keep going there again and again and again until it's like, I love it, Amy, how you said how he then goes C, D, C, D, C, D, A. Yeah. A. Yeah. And of course, to hitting to A, that's that's the shot that's really helped him a lot more in recent years. It's not just going cross court. It's helped him when he has had good results against Novak to hit the forehand down the line because he's got to, he's got to break that pattern. Yeah, it's the shot. Look. he it's, it's the shot he flattens out also just just technically when he hits inside out. Uh, that's the shot that he can flatten out a lot better than the the cross court. 
Look, I mean, Tsitsipas's backhand held up well. Anyone who watched that match would tell you that. At times, that thing did not look like it was breaking down. So, you know, in typical Nadal personality, he's just going to be relentless. And, and ultimately, it gave way. Well, I think, though, I think it's like, I, like we were talking before, the breakdown is more not so much at the pro level of it starting to miss a Tsitsipas backhand as much as to elicit for Nadal to elicit the kind of shots he wants. I mean, the basically, short ball, Nadal right? Shorter ball. When Nadal is hit, when Nadal hits his lefty forehand cross court to a one-handed backhand, he's saying, "How long? How long can you hit hard, deep, flat? Make me run." And Nadal says, "I really like this pattern." And and again, the difference with the one-hander and the two-hander, and you know this skill since you have one, a two-hander can a two-hander as Novak can say. Yeah, that forehand's not so deep. I'm going to go down the line now, hard and flat. One-hander, you can do that, but not as often, not as well. And that's really where the double leverage of the two hands are better than one comes into play. The, the ability to drive a backhand down the line mm -hmm. is what makes a two-hander a lot more effective than a one-hander. Well, as this match swung like a pendulum, a lot of it had to do with the Tsitsipas backhand. And it's, if it was surrendering short balls and uh, if he you know, if he was attacking well, doing damage and actually connecting on that backhand down the line. Um, I guess uh, one more, one more thing that I noticed on, on this, and then we'll, we'll go more macro because right now we're in the micro tactics. Um, <laughs> when Nadal drove his backhand a little bit uh, lower and flatter, that's when to me, Tsitsipas was protecting that side brilliantly. Like that wasn't bothering him. It's when he subtracted pace, added height, and just made it kick off the court with not a lot of pace. That's the one that Stefanos was, I think, giving up short balls off of. In fact, Gil, he even tried the drop shot from behind the baseline a couple times on that very shot high to the backhand. I recall once it actually worked, and I remember one that he missed. But for me, um, precision is a big deal with this because I mentioned the two zones, C and D. If, if Rafa hit to C, then Stefanos did have the opportunity to run around and hit forehand. And when he did that, often he would then take control of the point, either win it or become in control. So you really have to have a lot of precision to play this pattern, and Rafa does. Yeah. Well, and what you see, what you see from this is how, how physical, how much fitness and that is right. So a guy like Sitzbus has to recognize, okay, this one's in C. Here's my chance. I got to move around and I have to do something and I have to do something productive, whether it's inside out or inside in. And you see the broad arsenal in a way, what I liked about Sitzbus's effort, is kind of like the, the 2.0 of how Federer tried to, to break down Rafa when he was trying to beat Rafa on clay earlier in their rivalry in, let's say, Rome 06, or when he beat him in Hamburg in 07. And it, uh, it just shows you the way, kind of the legacy of the three on people. Like you'd see Titsmith, whether conscious or unconscious, he's taken in the lessons. Oh, I see. This is how Roger had to try to go about beating Rafa on clay or anywhere. And it's, and it's really hard. I mean, Nadal, Nadal's patterns are more obvious. He's more like the football. Here it comes. Yes. Here it comes deal with it. And Sitsipis, as we saw in that match, he, got, he even had championship points. There's a lot of decision-making that goes on. What do I do with the backhand? Drive it. Drive it cross court. Drive it down the line. Drop shot. Forehand. There are, there are a lot of concepts he has to have in his head throughout to beat Nadal on clay. Nadal doesn't have to have that many. He just has to kind of have that execution. That's what makes him great. It was a fantastic match. Yeah, it was really great. Stefanos has uh, one advantage over Federer. He's about three inches, maybe four inches taller, which helps it not get up as high, right? Mm -hmm. Can't teach that. So I do want I, I do want to throw that out there. But yeah, let's talk about um, the big picture for Nadal because this this tournament started off in a rather dire fashion. He lost the first set to Ilya Ivashka. Uh, then after his win um, over Cam Nori, his third match of the tournament, he was so. I don't want to say he was so dissatisfied, but he was uh, he felt the need to train more after the match. And as soon as he won <laughs> match point, 
He looked to his box. He said, reserve court two. After <laughs> winning an, an actual real tennis match in, in an ATP event, he went and he practiced afterwards, which it's not the first time he's done it, but it's still uh, rather, you know, I mean this in the best of ways, insane. Uh, so Nadal just rounds himself into form here, plays his best match uh, against PCB in the semifinal, and then takes it up another two notches against Titi Pas. So what, what does this mean for the, the French Open picture, the, the outlook of Nadal, Joel? Well, this is just Nadal's pattern. He just says that. I mean, I, you know it's not insane for him to practice after winning a quarterfinal match at a, at a tournament like that, that he just wants to get that feeling going. He, he's a homework guy. And the French is a tournament that most rewards the homework. You don't, it's not about moxie. It's not about thinking you've got a swagger. And Nadal is all about you know, building those bricks. So he's just got to put in that time. And he has his own self critique of what it means to be playing well. And of course, he'll be happy to have won this tournament, but he knows how he needs to feel about hitting the ball. And, and, and again, there's a, I think with all of these three, we're seeing this transcendence of offense and defense of what that means. I mean, there, these terms, these term, it, it'd be interesting to say, let's all write a match report without ever using the word offense and defense as a t and to see, because you see how these guys, it's about applying pressure. And for Nadal, for all that margin the top spin gives, it can all, it can, has potential to be passive if he's not swing through the ball, swing through the, and, and moving his court positioning. I mean, what I was really impressed by in this match was to see numerous occasions where Nadal really altered his court positioning a little bit more, recognizing he needs to take in a little bit more. I mean, you mentioned how Sitzbess has the um, little taller than Roger so he could drive the one-hander. Yeah, that's all he does. Remember, Sitzbess, he never he rarely slices unless he's hitting a, a drop shot. So Nadal knows he's got to be in this in this court position battle. And uh, it's just, I, look, it's just, it's just him. The we're seeing the pattern now. It's like back to the, the clay court season for Nadal. Two more tournaments for him to play before Paris. Very familiar. You know, guys, one thing that we haven't talked about is the um, little kerfuffle or whatever. What's that word? Ker kerfuffle. <laughs> kerfuffle. <laughs> that happened there. <laughs> Uh, that happened this past week when Nadal was asked about Djokovic innocently enough and Nadal comes out with the word obsessed with you know records the, the number of slams um, which touched off a, a firestorm on not just social media I mean there were a lot of articles written about it in, in mainstream media and you know and then you guys know I love Nadal, right? I, I love all three of them. I'm a huge fan of all three of them. But it was kind of unfortunate for Rafa that he would call Djokovic obsessed and then he wins a match and you see him out there rrr, rrr, training hard right after the match. I mean, who's obsessed, right? But how is obsessed define, an insult? Define, define obsession. Look, it's like, and I think I saw, I saw that, those quotes and then the other quotes. And it makes it, those are the type of those are the type of occurrences that make me glad I don't write about politics, huh. because that's all that world is. I, it's just people saying stuff and it being interpreted and what they mean and obsession. You're right. You're you're spot on, Amy. I mean, it's like obsessed. Well, Rafa's would say I'm a, he's obsessed with process. But even if you ask him, you know, these certain words, no one likes to say they're obsessed, even though they can be obsessed. I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that. I, I don't understand. I think Nadal said this. He meant no harm. I think Nadal would admit that he's obsessed. Um, everyone's obsessed. Oh my God. These are top five in the players in the world. They're, they're all obsessed. They're all obsessed. They are so obsessed. How is this an insult? I'm obsessed Yo, with I, many I things. I disagree. I disagree. I'm going to push back a little. I think he was asked specifically about the records, right? Yeah. And, and he's, he's um, there to promote his contract with the beer company, which is, you know, chill out, you know, live life, enjoy. So he's in that sort of frame of mind. I got to promote this Amstel. And, and he's asked about the records and he says something that I thought was very uncharacteristic, which was, you know, I'll let him be obsessed with that stuff. I'm just Rafa. I just go about my business and do my thing. And I really don't think that's true at all. I think Rafa does care and he doesn't just go about his business. He, he, 
fights his butt off. And uh, I thought it was a little bit of gamesmanship, very uncharacteristic and a little bit unfair to Novak. But I think it's all, it's to me, it's never more than 49% of what really matters with these folks anyway. It's just all like, you know, Pete Sampras used a great word for this once. He said, oh, commentary. I mean, it was a way of saying, it's not, this isn't about performance. This is about commentary. And here's Nadal chatting interview and he's kind of saying how he wishes to do it. And of course, of course, of course, look, you know, of course they're obsessed and they're driven and they're focused, but it's like, whatever, the tennis will be the tennis. You know, the words are going to just kind of like, the, the things they say. It's like, it reminds me when someone, someone told me once, well, Roger was saying this. I said, yeah, he said it. He said it. He said, I mean, you know, that, that's, he said it one day in one interview. It's not, it's not like he's not a Senator, not yeah. a president. He's just making a comment about something someday. And it's not that it gets blown up into anything. It's just words. I mean, I think they just fade into whateverness. And then what really matters is of course, then we see these guys inside the lines and that's where it all that's where it really plays out. Yeah. And it really, really plays out is these matches. And yeah, of course, look at Rafa. I mean, geez, this is obsessed to competitors anyone will ever yeah. see. And Novak too, and Roger as well. And every, no one wants to say that they're focused on the wrong things. I don't think, I don't think it's, I just, I guess I just don't think it's bad to be obsessed with breaking a record. I mean, I think, um, Man, I, I, I think in other sports, like this is totally accepted. I don't know if it's more taboo in tennis, but um, no, it's, uh, like, about outcome. it's about outcome discussing. It's like someone saying, I want to get all A's. I want to get all A's. Oh, I'm just, I just want to learn. I just want to learn. And do yeah. That. yeah. Yeah. That's how I interpreted it, which all is, you know, will you be a grade grubber? Fine. I'm going to live life and be amazing. Sure. You know, I, and I just, it just rubbed me the wrong way. I didn't like it. Okay. All right. Um, hmm, should we, uh, should we move on to, to Djokovic or is there anything else? I just want to put a bow on, on, uh, moving forward for Nadal. Like I felt, I felt this was really positive. No one had been better in the, at the start of clay court season than Titi Pass. And some, some Rafa fans will probably, or observers say, well, he double faulted on a, on a massive point in the tie break in the second set. And uh, he hasn't won a tie break against uh, a top 10 player in like his last six, um, or I, I don't have that exact, but it's something like mm. that. Um, you know, he has been showing some vulnerabilities, I'd say, but ultimately, you know, if he can beat Stefano Tsitsipas now, what's it gonna look like in three weeks when Nadal's gonna be inevitably in a better form. <laughs> and, you know, I think Titi Pass is the ultimate test right now. And Rafa just passed it with, I don't know, 80% of his game. Are you implying that Titi Pass isn't going to be playing better in three weeks? Uh, I'm, it, he might not. Uh, no, I think he might. But, but see, th this is the fun part about sports. It's like, I don't know if Nadal was 75%, 90%, 110% of his 34 year old game. It, I, I, who knows what that is? So he's, yeah, he's going to be finding form. Who knows? I think for Nadal, these two more tournaments are kind of going to be a lot about continuing to refine uh, in Madrid and Rome, but also healthy, healthy, no, no tweaks, no twists, no any of that. In the meantime, since is a young, I mean, look at this guy, this guy's playing some great tennis. He's 22 years old. He had championship points and the King of clay. He won Monte Carlo. So he's got to be feeling pretty good too. And who knows how he's going to improve with the younger ones. You don't know how much more, how much more upside they have. I mean, Here's my question, and that is, I, and I this occurred to me when I was watching intensely watching this match and seeing how well Tsitsipas was playing. Of course, Nadal will be the favorite, the odds-on favorite to win Roland Garros. He will be, as he always is, until he maybe he loses or he isn't anymore. But who's the number two? Uh, you would think it would be Novak, right? Um, but as well as Tsitsipas is playing right now, um, I think that that's to be determined in the next few weeks. Well, that's the Madrid quarter or semi we're curious to see. We want to see Novak and Tsitsipas play. Yeah. And see that come off. They had a five setter last year in Paris that Novak won. Tsitsipas pretty weary by the end of that match. Novak beat him pretty easily in the fifth set. So now that's kind of the match we want to see. Right? We want to see who can establish well, what do you call it? Pole position or something? Yeah, who's who's the who's the second contender behind Nadal in Paris? 
and how well is they playing? Does Sitsipas win one of those other Masters thousands? Yeah. Does Novak get his piece of the pie by then? I mean, Novak, this is a good ch- time for us to segue into Novak and the epic well, he played. Well, well, what uh, also Dominic team um, will That's be right. will be coming back, and he beat Novak in the semis in in twenty nineteen at Roland Garros, and he normally occupies the spot that right now Tsitsipas is occupying, which is that uh, you know that third threat or that outside you know next after Nadal threat. Uh, but yeah, let's let's talk about Novak now. Um, what a what a match that was. I mean, Karatsev is is legit. He's not going anywhere. Um, but big takeaways from from that match, Joel. I think one thing that if you're looking at Novak, hey, he fought long and hard. I mean, he looked pretty fit and played some arduous, rough and tumble tennis. So that's a pretty good it's a pretty good effort. Of course, he didn't want to lose at that stage. He wants to win a tournament always, much less the one in his home country. But uh I thought that was, and again, I see these new ones. Maybe this might, we see that we've seen so many next gens. We've seen the peer, we've seen the peer generation. We've seen a next gen and like, let's say you're Dimitrov and Nishikor. We've seen so many ones and, and these, you see how much they've, they've taken it to a new level. You look at Karatsev and his physicality and his serve and his ground strokes. It's just so impressive, so powerful. I, I kind of throw this one out. I mean, when I was watching, it, it, don't get me wrong, it was a great match. Um, but when I was watching that match, I was thinking, how much pressure does Novak put on himself always? Um, and, and, you know, he, he backs it up. Um, but I could not imagine being in my hometown, being so invested in a tournament, and, and maybe the one after, by the way, and having to come through in front of the the hometown crowd I mean that's a lot of pressure that he puts on himself and he wasn't feeling well he said that he was having some dizziness um and you know it was a very close match so uh eh, it's early in clay season uh Karatsev I have not figured that guy out yet I want to dive into that I mean I'm not sure what's happening there um i'm sure it'll get figured out at some point but what do you what do you mean what do you mean well first of all i mean i think yeah the the loss actually to me the loss of that length versus an opponent who's been playing that well to me from a novak standpoint is fairly positive it's not yes it's not an aberrational it's not it's not losing two and three to someone you've barely heard of on the second round so that's a fine the fine competitive go but as far as Figure, tell me what you're. Uh, tell me what you're curious about with him. Well, we'll we'll talk about it someday when we do a podcast on Karatsev. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's certainly an unprecedented rise. And it, well, I mean, Joel, I don't know if you could uh, come up with examples of Karatsev esque stories, but at age 27, he's suddenly uh, a world. No, beater. I don't think there's. I, I, it's pretty hard to find anyone. There who, are in uh, other sports. Yes. Right. Right. In other sports. Right. In, in the team sports in the team sports, but, or maybe in golf, might there be some in golf? Well, that maybe. doesn't count with the age thing in golf, right? Golf Maybe breaks some all the... in, in, in some Olympic sports. Uh, Jose Bautista in baseball comes to mind. He came out of nowhere. I don't know. Uh, but no the, yeah, was, uh, sport, it's amazing. It, it, he's, he's impressive. And, and again, we're going to see, you know, and we're going to see a lot of things when we start playing best of five set matches in Paris. That's a very different yeah. thing. So guys, in one way, I agree with you about Novak that like, it's, it's, it's not a horrible loss. There's, there's nothing to be overly, you know, concerned about with that being said, I do think it reinforced some patterns that I've been seeing really since like 2019, which is that the slower the court surfaces are getting just the, the worse, the, the easier to beat Novak is because there's just not that much offense coming off of his racket sometimes uh, when the when the court surface helps him out, his depth, his precision is a little bit more potent. But like, how many forehand winners did he hit in this match? Not many. Uh, on every break point, and Karatsev saved twenty three of them. Novak did the I'm going to sit back and defend, which is so effective. I would never discredit that uh, that style because it's you know 
again, it is so, so difficult to, to handle. But there was a point in that match where it was very evident Karatsev was up to the task. He is off the, when it comes to creating offense off the ground, A1, A1. And Novak needed to make him play defense and just never could really do it. Uh, so it's not that this match was any kind of shift for me in, in how I see Novak, but it maintains this feeling that I've had for a couple years now that if someone plays great, if someone plays incredible against Novak on clay, it's often good enough to, to pull out the win. Well, it's the new, it's the aggression. If you look at, it's like, it's like taking the Robin Soderling versus Nadal, which was like a, a six on the, a, 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 a sixth gear. It was like a sixth gear uh, when he beat Nadal in 09, but it's like, oh, I see. This is what it needs to be. And it's just like the same way that you've seen Sitsipas build an up a variation of the Feder arsenal, right? It's like, it's like the bar has been raised. So this is what we have to do, but it might not be incredible. I mean, if it's incredible, it can't be replicated. So then we'll have to see if it's replicated because if it's replicated, it's no longer, it, it's not incredible. It's just, yeah. this is the new bar. And that's going to be exciting. I think for people like Novak and, and Rafa, and, and of course, we're all really curious about Roger when this little go on clay to see how that works. Like see the, Roger sits a pest. There's a difference for me though. Cause I think you can play incredible against Novak center court Wimbledon right now, or, or in two months from now, you might still lose. You, you'll probably still lose. Uh, but I think if you play incredible against Novak on clay, I think you have a much better chance at winning. Right. But I mean, what's defining incredible is my question. In other words, it's like, we're seeing some of these guys play incredible. What's incredible, but this may become a new standard that might not be considered. zone. <laughs> okay. I think there's a new um, area of exercise science or exercise physiology called resistance to fatigue. And they're, they're really looking at it right now in the sport of cycling. They're determining that if you have this resistance to fatigue across several metrics, you know, your oxygen levels, your cognitive, your this, your that, then you're going to win. And I, I was reading this study and I was like, wow, this really applies to clay court tennis. Yeah. And our three... Uh, but especially Djokovic and Nadal really have that resistance to fatigue. Their level when they've been playing many hours is comparable to when they first started or more comparable. So um, if I were, you know, Djokovic, I wouldn't let that slip. Yeah. Uh, in this match, he was doing all the running the whole time. And eventually there was a couple service games in a row in the third set where uh, Karatsev was serving first. And by the time it was time for Djokovic to serve, he was just exhausted. He got through a couple of them, but then I think it was at two, th no, I think it was at three all uh, or, or, or two, three Novak serving or uh, one of those must've been two, three Novak serving. He, he was done physically. And Amy, he did say he got dizzy. I think he got dizzy from running for three and a half hours. Well, right, because he's playing someone this, I was thinking about some paradigms. You know, when someone like Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi came along, to displace the likes of John McEnroe and Jimmy Connors, it appeared initially incredible because it was new. But once it's extant and it's working for a while, it's, it's just raising the bar. So, and the challenge of course, for the veterans is always how they, how they continue to set the pace. Are they setting the pace? Are they reacting to it? Are they ahead of it? And I think, I, I guess we're gonna see uh, how Novak, I think you've got a great point, Gil, about Novak on clay which is really interesting, which all of this is turning upside down what people think clay is about. It's a racket head. It's racket head acceleration. Racket yeah. head speed is what contemporary clay court tennis is about. So where does Novak fit into that? An aging Novak. Cause I, I love 2011 Novak on clay. I think he's fantastic. Uh, I don't think 2021 Novak on clay is the same guy. Well, that's going to be interesting to see. Yeah. Fascinating. So we'll yeah. see in these other events, how that surfaces too. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but Karatsev so offensive that Novak was just, uh, I don't think it's a, a matter of fitness. He will get more fit as we approach the, the French. Cause that's what he does. Um, you know, nowadays with how they work their training blocks, but, uh, you know, he was depleted because I just think he was corner to corner for three sets. Um, and yeah, Karatsev was, is incredible right now though. He, but he really to is. my 
to my point from an earlier podcast, it might have been the last one. One thing I do want to look at is if a player is able to take out a member of the big three during a slam or one of these other tournaments, does that then put them at a disadvantage? Maybe not in the next match, could be in the next match or maybe a match or two down the road. And of course, Karatsev have lost to Berrettini, who, by the way, is a good clay court player, even though he has a reputation for being a serve bot. Um, he's not. Mm-hmm. He's, well, a, he's, he's, a he's a racket head speed guy. Yeah. And, uh, and that final was, yeah, that final start off kind of sluggish. And yeah, that's, yeah, that's the thing about the, the letdown after the, after the win over one of the big three. That's interesting. So yeah, better get them in the finals. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, next week off for the big three, it is uh, Munich and it is uh, Esteril are the two. ATP events next week. Um, and then we will move on to Madrid. Um, another big event, home, home event for Nadal, but he, he has six titles there, which is uh, lesser so than the, uh, the other clay court events on the calendar somehow. Um, and that'll be exciting. Um, and we're looking forward to that. So that'll do it for this episode of three. Nadal champion in Barcelona for the 11th time. No, the 12th. I think it's the 12th. Uh, (laughs) And Djokovic out in the semifinals uh, against Karatsev in Belgrade. Remember, three is available on all podcast platforms. We greatly appreciate it if you leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, like the video, leave a comment, and we will see you next time on the next episode of Three.